I'm so excited for uh, today's show. We have yeah. Dr. Ernie Ward, a plant-based veterinarian. Welcome to our show. Ernie, good morning. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge <laughs> fan of what you guys are doing. You're making such a positive impact on the planet, and you're helping out oh. animals and people. So I, I'm really honored and thrilled to be with you today. Oh, thanks oh, so thank much. Thank you so much. Likewise, you know, yeah. like we're so excited. I've never actually met a plant-based veterinarian. And when I heard about you, you know, and I saw like, um, what's Shark Tank, right? Yeah. Is it the American show? Mm -hmm. We saw like one of your um, guys, right? Ryan. They were presenting your the dog food. And that was really impressive what you guys are doing. And yeah, please tell the listeners more about yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, as you mentioned, a veterinarian. I've been in practice uh, nearly 30 years now. So <laughs> that's uh, quite a, yeah. an accomplishment in and of itself. Um, you know, I've been plant based, uh, vegetarian, and vegan since the mid 1980s. Uh, I've also done a wide variety of ultra endurance events, including multiple Ironman. So I can tell you firsthand that you can, live a you can live a long, prosperous, and healthy life on a plant based diet. You don't need to kill animals to survive and thrive. So, uh, kind of get that out of the way but you're right it is it is a bit of a, a unusual situation when you know veterinarians who we dedicate our lives to serving animals and yet the vast majority um, you know eat animals continue to kill them for consumption and mm -hmm. I think you know one of my things especially this last part of my career is to really try to impress upon my colleagues that we should be looking at this more carefully you know we should be critiquing our actions on the world around us and you know with today's technological advances including like our wild earth dog food you know just using innovative protein sources you know do we need to rely on the old animal based foods uh, for good health and of course the the research is clear on this you've had innumerable guests on your podcast and show you know who expound upon that but you know again my question is if we've dedicated our lives to serving and protecting and you know trying to avoid any harm why do we continue to support factory farming for example and i understand they object to that terminology but let's call it what it is these are highly efficient mechanized farming operations all of my family incidentally jane and julia were farmers i mean i i my 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 father and mother were the only two who quote unquote escaped the farm <laughs> and so you know i'm deeply embedded in this in the south of the united states so i know farming i know what goes on i know there are plenty of good farmers but i also know that the farming that we see today in 2020 is vastly different than when i was growing up as a child in the 1970s and so you know we got to own it we got to try to make it better and i think again as a as a profession and as people and as colleagues like yourself we can make a difference we can, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, we think more for ourselves. Oh, yeah, being plant-based, you know, we can do it. But some people actually feel bad about um, making their dogs or cats vegan, especially cats, right? They're more like, that's kind of torture because in nature they eat meat, right? But it's not like that they eat wild ca uh, caught like meat, right? They get the factory farm meats usually, right? The, the, what is it like the leftovers of slaughterhouses, right? Are all mixed yeah. into the food. Like the pet food, if you think of it. Right, and, and that's one element. And I'll tell you, you know, that's one of the things I try to dispel, you know. And, and in the book, you've mentioned two things that I've, I've sort of named over the past decade or so of writing and researching on these topics. And the first is what you, you said, you know, people feel you know, uncomfortable, like it's somehow harming their cat. And I call this uh, in our book, too, which I encourage people to go out and read if they want to know more. Nice. Shameless <laughs> plug, but the Clean Pet Food Revolution. I mean, this is, if you are plant based in your life you, and you have pets, you should definitely check this out. It's really, I mean, it's incredibly well researched. I'm very, very proud of that book. But but this feeling that we're somehow not doing the right thing by them, I call it ethical feeding friction. So now mm -hmm. let's already say that you're a vegan or vegetarian or you're somehow on this plant-based journey along with us. And you're opening up that can of cat food and you know that inside that can is a dead animal, right? Or byproducts or whatever we want to call that. And so you right. feel that friction, right? That feeding friction, the ethics of it start to confound and confuse you and, and you don't know what to do. And so most people just dismiss it. They just sort of put it aside and go about their business and say, oh, it sucks, but you know that's what I have to do. But then there are people like us and others that are saying, well, we can innovate. So the ethical feeding friction is real. If you're watching this today or listening to this wherever you are, and you do have that little moment of unsettling, you know, when you open that bag or that can, remember that there are lots of people like you and we are rapidly 
really bringing solutions on board. For dogs, we have this very well settled. You know, the research is very, very clear. Dogs are omnivores, although I'll get to in a second why I hate that term and why I think it's irrelevant. But, um, you know, cats are a little bit trickier and we are doing some active research and I would say expect solutions sooner than later. But then the other part of this that I think we have to be careful about is us assuming that our dogs and cats are in any way directly linked to their primal ancestors, right? I mean, to think of your dog as a wolf, not only is it incorrect scientifically and from the genetic records and proof, but, you know, when we think about our cats as being hunters in the wild, it's true, but we've domesticated them for thousands of years, taken away a lot of those those abilities, you know? So, I mean, if my cat, itty bitty kitty, had to go out and fend for herself, I'm afraid she'd be knocking on my door after a couple of days, okay? (laughs) So, we have to be aware that we've changed them significantly, both genetically, behaviorally, and certainly, you know, with their nutritional needs. And so, when we look at the genetics of the genome, if you will, of dogs and cats, we've seen significant what we call genetic drift. So, if you look at wolves and you look at today's domestic dog, whatever breed it may be, there's significant different is in starch metabolism, for example. And we're just now starting to uncover this with cats, but we're starting to see that domestic cats have significant differences in the genes that allow them to digest many starches and carbohydrates. So they're not exactly like the tiger that we think about in Africa. <laughs> now, it's true, they all share a lineage, but you know, it's sort of like looking at our own evolutionary tree. I mean, we share many genetic traits. 98, 99% of our genome is that of a chimpanzee, but yet we're dramatically different, right? So I mean, I mean, we right. have to understand that these subtle shifts in genes can have profound impact on how, our, how we appear and act and live and, and eat. So I want to touch on that. The other thing, too, is just to, to be cautious about the framework that you're somehow, and, and you said the word torturing our cats, right, because they're supposed to be eating. And when we frame it like this for the rest of the world, we actually then lend into a narrative that supports that we're somehow depriving our cat. And that's just not how nutrition and health works, right? Right. So at the end of the day, the other thing I want to touch on is that ingredients are simply nutrient vessels. So see, your body doesn't care where it gets those amino acids, those fats, those minerals, those vitamins, whatever nutrients that you need. It just cares that you get them to them, right? So the nutrient vessel, the ingredient, is just a way of getting those those essential elements into your body. So it can be meat, it can be pea protein, it can be you know whatever. It can be yeast protein in the in the, what we use uh, as a primary sor- source in our dog food. So the body then immediately breaks down these nutrient vessels. As I say, they unload the good stuff, the mm-hmm. nutrients, and then utilize that. So in no way, if you are providing the nutrients that your cat or your dog or yourself needs, no way are you depriving them of anything. In fact, you're only supporting good health. So I hope that helps you know out there, but I'm just right. really, you know, Julia, how often we are attacked, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I really want us as animal advocates to be super aware like of how our language and the framework, because it, it does, as a veterinarian, you know, I'm constantly trying to overcome these biases, right? These misconceptions of even my colleagues and so, you know, we, we are no way depriving them. In fact, what we are actually trying to do is give them more of the nutrients that your dog, your cat, yourself needs for a healthy life. Right. Yeah. Like great. I just hear all the time, like with cats, you have to be more careful, right? And I actually I, heard some stories where people did it wrong, right? And then mm-hmm. these are so exposed in media, right? Oh, you can do it so right. wrong, like torturing <laughs> this um, cat vegan, being vegan, right? But with dogs, it's so much easier. And then right. I think people are a bit scared, right, when they have their own cat well, to really do it and wrong. And they should be because, quite frankly, we haven't had good animal protein-free cat foods, right? There's only a handful in the entire world for the exact reasons that you just laid out. It's very difficult to source non-animal sources of certain nutrients. And so Mm -hmm. we and others are actively pursuing this research. We are very, very close to making some, we believe, some significant breakthroughs. And so I think you're going to see these products for cats coming online over the next couple of years, okay? If not sooner, some of the hurdles that we have to overcome, quite frankly, are just regulatory. The regulations are really old and archaic, and they haven't kept up with food technology over the past decade. So, you know, Shane and Julia, what many people fail to realize is that a lot of the progress that we are making in plant-based foods like Beyond and Impossible really is just uh, an improvement on existing foods, right? So, like our dog food. 
every ingredient that we use in that dog food is what is considered by the FDA generally recognized as safe. That means that this stuff has been around for 40 or 50 years. These ingredients that we're using are are well established. And all we've done is improve the efficiency, the concentration, and ultimately the nutritional value. So as we move forward in, in science and technology, you know, it's just such an exciting time for cats. Like it's almost here, so just hold it, hold <laughs> yeah. back. But let me get back to this real quick thing about the omnivore carnivore dilemma. Mm-hmm. And I spend a chapter in in the Clean Pet Food Revolution sort of working with my co-authors on why these terms are irrelevant, archaic outdated and quite frankly meaningless and really all they do is serve to divide us because people are like oh they're carnivores oh they're omnivores oh they're herbivores and honestly those terms were originating in the mid 1800s right this is Linnaeus time so what they were trying to do biologists of the 1860s um, were trying to say we need to categorize biology we are learning more about the world we have microscopes we have all these tools now so we want to categorize it but if you're sitting in a, in a dark library in England and you're trying to describe what a, a tiger eats or needs, <laughs> right, you're going to rely on skeletons, on the anatomy that you can observe, mm-hmm. on pictures, on field reports from people that had actually been to Africa. And this led these early biologists to falsely categorize certain animals on their diet needs based on skeletal functions, right? So they were looking at their skull and they go, wow, a bear and a lion look a lot alike. They got these big fangs. Well, they must eat meat because we know that, you know, we have reports of these tigers taking down gazelles and whatever, right? And unfortunately, that's completely wrong because as we know today, bears can eat on a wide variety. They're true omnivores. In fact, bears get their energy to hibernate from berries, (laughs) Right. <laughs> before you know they don't stock up now, of course there are they eat salmon and other things but they're omnivorous raccoons right, right? i mean we can go down mm-hmm. the list of of animals you know panda bears right that are right. categorized as uh, falsely as as carnivores and so i think that we really have to let go of these terms and look at the nutrient requirements which is why i always go back to it is about the nutrients it is about the nutrients we have this thing called an ingredient bias and this is just a byproduct of our upbringing and experience right we we tend to think that meat imparts certain things and it's associated with health and vitality and strength and building muscles it's not the meat It's the amino acids that are contained within the meat that the body unlocks and then accesses to grow muscles, right? Mm -hmm. So we really need to elevate the language. We need to elevate our thinking and understanding and say, look, it's not actually the ingredient. It's actually what's in that. And that allows us to now more specifically and precise prescribe nutrition. So it's really exciting. But again, I want us to realize that if you want to use these terms, dogs and people are clearly omnivores. They can survive on a wide variety of, of ingredients. And cats are a little bit more towards the carnivorous route, meaning that it's more difficult for us to source. And again, the hiccup here is government regulation and just sourcing, scaling it up. You know, we It is very expensive. We could produce some of these foods today if the regulations would allow us. But they would be very expensive. So we're kind of waiting. You know, a lot of things have to happen. It's super exciting if you're a plant-based uh, person because the costs are coming down. Availability wow. is broadening. I mean, you know, just it's almost here for cats. Right. Thanks for clarifying <laughs> that. That's really exciting. Yeah. So how did you start your vegan journey? Just get into yeah. personal talks. Yeah, I <laughs> know. And I, and I like this very much. I mean, you know, I grew up in South Georgia. And so... You know, there's really two things that impacted me greatly as a young man. And the first is, you know, of course, I grew up with fried chicken and ribs and what pork chops and the all South, that stuff. Tex mix. Bacon. Yeah, all yeah. the yeah. southern comfort foods, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly, because yes. that was my family. And remember, too, I'm coming from a farming environment, you know, so we right. have right. chickens and cows and pigs, right? So, I mean, this is what I'm living with. But when I was seven, there's something very traumatic. I lost a dog horribly, and you can read it online. I've, I've shared this story multiple places. But I, that was the time when I was seven years old. I said, I'm going to be a vet. I'm going to take care of animals. I'm not going to allow them to die needlessly because I was involved with this. Two farmers, my dog got shot for allegedly killing chickens. And so um, Ouch. 
that was the point. So now you're going and you're growing up, but you know, you're 10 years old, you're 12 years old, you're 14 years old. You don't control the grocery store. You know, you don't get to cook the meals. Uh, so you kind of go along with it. I'm always, I'm unsettled. Um, and at that time, you have to realize this is in the 70s and, and you know, early 80s. And, you know, my parents were like, when I was like, you know, do we need to eat bacon? And they're like, well, yeah, you have to eat bacon or you won't grow up. You know, you'll, you'll die. You'll <laughs> yeah. be stunted or whatever. Yeah, right. <laughs> All that nonsense. And, and it's okay, right? You're a kid, so you, you don't have the power to actually refuse. I mean, I guess I could have gone on a hunger strike, but I wasn't like that. You know, I wasn't that awoke <laughs> at the time. Right. But anyway, so then when I went off to college, um, two things happened. Number one, I watched both of my grandfathers die prematurely due to heart cardiovascular disease. Mm. Okay. So it's like, wow. And then when you start to explore further, like their fathers, my great grandfathers, they also died of heart attacks. And wait, you know, their fathers also died of heart attacks. So suddenly I'm realizing, holy smokes, <laughs> there's a pattern here. <laughs> right. I don't want to be that guy. Right. Right. So, um, so I'm going off to college. So that was the first thing. The second thing was I was finally able to control my own diet. And I was like, I'm not going to eat my friends anymore. It was literally that simple. It was like, wow, whatever they were eating and how they were living, I'm not going to smoke and drink excessively. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to exercise. I'm going to do all those things. And at the same time, ethically, I feel much more comfortable. And I was really fortunate. I met my wife and we're still together in 1986. And, and she was completely on board with this as well. You know, wow. she we both had the same feelings, you know, towards compassion, towards animals, and really towards all beings. We're kind of that that type of person. And so, you know, we just began it. Luckily, she is a phenomenal cook. Uh, so, good. of course, we raised our, our two daughters. You know, they've never eaten animals. And so, so you wow. know, it's a, it's a really wonderful uh, way to, to have spent, you know, m most of my adult life since 1986. Uh, but, but then, you know, what was really tragic for me was when I got into veterinary school, you know, my father, again, having grown up and having the same genes as, as his father, uh, wound up having, you know, um, open heart surgery. And so, that was really solidified it for me. I was like, I'm definitely on the right path. Uh, I did convert him before he passed, you know, so after he had his heart attack and open heart surgery, um, he didn't have a full blown heart attack. He had like a almost full blown. <laughs> and uh, regardless, he became more plant based. And so I'm really happy that, you know, he did find his heart. He later succumbed to cancer, which was a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so that's really it. And I think that for me, you know, there are two types of advocates, right? So, most of my professional career, you know, and I've been very fortunate to write and lecture all around the world at, you know, at all the major vet conferences at most of the veterinary schools, you know, in the country. And so for me, you know, it's one of those things where I live by example, you know, I give a lot of health and wellness talks and, you know, you just sort of subtly drop it in there. You say, hey, you know, it's much healthier to ditch the meat. Um, and then, of course, there's other advocates that are, you know, going to be a little more more vocal and, and forward. But I think whatever you're doing in your plant-based journey, journey, just, you know, I, be aware that people are watching you, right? I mean, you're leading by example. And so, I think right. it's very, very important for people like us to say, make sure that, you know, we are living that good example so that people can learn and, and hopefully improve their own well-being. Right, totally. Yeah, yeah you're the Great said. legend already from the story <laughs> I hear, you know, you even yeah. raised your two daughters, Regan, you know, that's amazing. Because that's yeah, also and, not uh, that easy. Yeah. And, and they're becoming advocates, you know, uh, wow. they're off, you know, they awesome. don't live at home anymore. They're off at school and, and they really, you know, you, you can tell that these types of messages landed well. And, uh, and so as a parent, you know, I think Laura and I, my wife and I are, are really, really proud of that because they, they see injustice in the world and they speak out, you know, and, uh, and again, not just animal issues, but, you know, just humanity issues. Right. And of course we're seeing tremendous things with racism and black lives matter. And, and it's really, I'm really proud to see my, my daughters now actually, you know, taking that next step in Good. advocacy. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. So uh, what inspired you to create Wild Earth? You just decided one day, yeah, you know, nothing good out there. Let's my, make something. My or, dogs need something yummier. Or was there like a story behind it? Did you have, you know, pets there's, and you wanted to make story. sure? All right. We'd love to hear <laughs> of it. Of course. Then. Of course. Always so, a story. More amazing stories. <laughs> so imagine, you know, I'm living my entire life as what I perceive to be the good guy. I'm not a part of the problem. I'm not contributing to climate change. I'm not, you know, causing the inhumane treatment of animals. Heck, I don't support factory farming. I do everything against that, right? right. I always viewed myself as the good guy in this dilemma. And the sad thing is, 
like most veterinarians and quite frankly most pet parents, I was ignorant to the impact that pet food manufacturing was having on the climate and animal welfare, right? It was just one of those things that hadn't really considered, right. you know? Right. And so in 2017, something, a research paper was published that, that changed the trajectory of my life, why I wrote this book, why we started this company, why I'm now much more openly advocating for, for ending, you know, factory farming and, and animal meat consumption. Greg Oaken and his team at UCLA published a paper that examined the contributions to greenhouse gas emissions by pet food manufacturing in the U.S. Again, I'm thinking, I'm the good guy here, right? I'm not part of the problem. I'm the solution. If everybody just lived like me and my family, we'd be fine. Right. But in his research, Oaken uncovered and proved that 25 to 30 percent of the total greenhouse gas emissions in the United States were directly linked and caused to pet food manufacturing. Further, oh, wow. Oaken's research concluded that about 25% of all animal meats created, produced, slaughtered in the United States were being eaten by dogs and cats. Crazy. 30 pounds <laughs> of fish were being eaten by domestic cats, our friendly indoor cats, a year. That's wow. more than twice what the average U.S. American, American adult eats. So suddenly now, this paper lands, it's published, I am no longer the good guy in the story, right? <laughs> I'm now part of the problem. Right. And it was an awakening, and, and th so this is in 2017, the beginning of it, and by the end of 2017, Wild Earth was launched. So a lot of other things, of course, great, you know, serendipitous, uh, Ryan Bethencourt, who is our CEO, and I were both presenting at a veterinary innovation conference. And so we just, a lot of people sort of said, hey, you guys should get together. You guys are kind of talking about the same things. I think, you know, it'd be beneficial. And, and honestly, it was just a, you know, sprint from there on. And so I think that in life, you know, there, there are several things that, you know, and, and wherever you are in your personal journey that will tip you and nudge you in a certain direction. And the first thing is always be open-minded, like always be aware sure. of what's happening because don't think that like in my story that, you know, I could have gone on being oblivious to the damages that I was actually inadvertently, you know, contributing to. So be open-minded. The second thing is be willing to change and adapt. So now I started to say, wait a second. Okay, Ernie, you've sort of been this quiet advocate for all of these years and it served you well, but now Somebody has pointed research in your face that says you're a lot more culpable than perhaps you've considered yourself. <laughs> speak up, you know, and so that's why we've done lots of other things, uh, you know, not just the clean pet food revolution and not just Wild Earth, but, you know, my advocacy is now extending, you know, much more openly. Right. And are right. you wanting to make also wet food for pets? Because right yes. now it's more dry food, right? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So, again, you know, we're a startup, you know, and so that means that we have very limited resources. <laughs> that means that, you know, we do go on shows like Shark Tank to try right. to <laughs> ask people like Mark Cuban to invest in us, you know. Nice. So, we are right at the, you know, this is the first early stages. You have to realize, I mean, and, and sometimes I guess I have to sit back and check myself. Our dog food was only launched last August, August really? of 2019. Wow. Oh, yes. So, you know, this is a sprint. Um, sure. and, and, uh, and really, Julia, to, to get back to the cat question, like all of those things were deep in the research and development stage. It's just a, a lot of other things, you know, have to come in. You have to pass a lot of different regulations and testing and so forth. And so, you know, th these are slower processes and really cost is a barrier. I mean, to right. really make the food mm -hmm. that I want to make that this is a challenge to get it at a cost affordable price. And, you know, and like you said, like I want to have... Uh, canned food. I want to have fresh food. All of those things are coming. It's just a matter of cost. And then for us as a company to be able to actually afford and sustain because, you know, this this is, and I'm sure everybody who's listening or watching this can relate. This is a weird time. Mm -hmm. right? It so, is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, like we, you know, there's been some hiccups for us, and you know, we've kind of like had to really reevaluate and re-strategize because you know, COVID has really changed how we interact with our customers, how we conduct R and D, you know, how we, dis you know, discover new things. I mean, it's really changed it from from a lab perspective as well. See, we need to adapt here again, right? Yeah. It's like we constantly <laughs> have to adapt. You know, it's like 
the evolution is never ending you know like some people think oh but we used to be like the prey or whatever and hunting and doing yeah all for thousands things. of years we didn't wear yeah. masks and have a coronavirus running around right. so <laughs> right. well, that doesn't right. help now does it right totally. so we got to evolve i feel like people are stuck in old traditions and old ways and they're going to be yeah. left behind. We got to move forward, right? Exactly. Yeah. Forward. And you're saying that's a really good point because this is a natural evolutionary adaptive pr- part of the process. I mean, you know, there have to be upheavals, tumultuous changes, right? I mean, you know, without an asteroid striking the planet, you know, the planet Earth, that is, you know, <laughs> hundreds of millions of years ago, the dinosaurs probably would not have gone extinct the way they did, which would, would, yeah. would not have led to our development. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that, like right now, obviously, this is horrible tragic unprecedented pandemic we yeah. all are stressed and and fearful i mean i'll be honest you know for me every day it's like you know wow am i going to interact with someone who might transmit this to me and i have an elderly mother that i care for right so you know right. it's frightening but the the point is this is part of humanity this is part of history and mm. as long as we can somehow stick together and continue to be progressive i mean we're going to get through this you know it will be stronger like you said Mm -hmm. i agree on that yeah so i got a question that's personal my sister's dog has arthritis uh he's virtually allergic to all animal products by default by default (laughs) uh so he's vegan by default but she would wanted us to ask you what would you feed a dog who has arthritis yeah, it's kind of interesting. We just conducted and, and we've published on our website at wildearth.com the analysis. We asked over 3,000 of our customers who'd been feeding our plant based, you know, wild earth dog food uh, for several months. So since we launched, we just said, hey, how, what are you seeing? What are the health benefits? And joint health, incidentally, was one of the top benefits that they saw. And I think, right. A, you mentioned a really important part by eliminating animal meats, we're probably not only reducing allergies like your, your, sister's dog has but also inflammation right i mean there's well established you've had numerous guests who've (laughs) talked about the pro-inflammatory aspects of red meats so i think that lowering the allergy i mean i'm sorry the uh the inflammatory threshold actually helps tremendously the other thing is adding we added uh you know and again part of this formulation for me was to you know i kind of got to do my dream formulation here but we added high levels of omega-3 fatty acids dha and so if i'm giving that advice to your to your your friend or your sister it's to a make sure that you are using an an anti-inflammatory diet whenever possible i always am going to lean towards of course plant-based for dogs and then the second thing is to really boost omega-3s because it's the ratio in the body of omega-6s which primarily are from plants you know particularly like like corns and and things like that and then to omega-3s which we use an algal source and if you're you know when people say you know what's your desert island supplement for me it's always (laughs) going to be algal dha You know, I've been taking this for 30 plus years. And so my point is that you really want to do things that reduce inflammation. So boost it, you know, add additional DHA. That's a really easy thing to do. And then, of course, as it progresses, it's really important for pet owners, uh, especially dog owners, not to ignore the early subtle signs of osteoarthritis because Mm. you are going to wind up having to use most likely a prescription anti-inflammatory because what's happening if that joint is, is painful it's inflamed and right. when there's inflammation we're denuding the subchondral bone which is actually this covering of the joint surface and if we allow that inflammation to persist then of course we just accelerate the demise of the mm. bone and the joint worsens and it's a vicious cycle so I, ultimately i wind up breaking that cycle with the use of of pharmacology right so you can actually improve it although like the arthritis is so like got so bad in a way so yeah it, it depends it's great. So we can't, there's no cure and you don't reverse it. That's why it's so important to right. initiate and intervene early because as the inflammation persists in that joint, it's just denuding. It's just breaking down. And what you wind up having literally is a joint that becomes now, you know, we sometimes even refer to this as gristle. It's just raw wow. bone on raw bone, which is intensely painful. And if you, I always tell people, if you want to know what this feels like, talk to somebody who's had a knee or hip replacement and they will most likely tell you about their excruciating pain pain experience prior to surgery oh crazy yeah well thank you for that i'll have to tell my sister to give him some algal oil 
So I'm omega three. Yeah. And get his, or maybe uh, hemp oil, or does it have to be like a an alga oil? Could it be another like source of omega three, like flax or yeah. ALA? Yeah, that, it was a really good question. So the, the, when you look at the omega threes, yeah, you definitely are going to wind up using an algal source. When okay. you look at flax and others, those oxidize so rapidly that unless it's freshly ground, uh, you know, especially flax or something, which right. is the richest, going to be a plant source, uh, yeah. it's going to oxidize and then of course be un, it's not going to be bio available and so that's why we okay. tend to lean towards pure sources of dha and just remember this is the algae that's where the fish get their dha which is why people use fish oils right so <laughs> just go to the source for like eat like the elephants right yeah you know, mm-hmm. so go to the source exactly yeah exactly so what do you feed your dog on a regular basis do you feed them the your wild earth or do you give them some fruits and vegetables some peppers i know some dogs know like watermelon them. yeah i heard yeah. you feed them like smoothies too right when you have your smoothies yeah. So you're right. So my base diet and my two dogs, I'm proud to say they're Border Terrier rescues. They have been eating wild earth longer than any dog on the planet, which is kind of a remarkable thing to be able to say. That's awesome. You can imagine they they went through several prototypes, iterations. So they've been eating this since, you know, the early, early days. Um, And again, what's really remarkable is we continue to do a a really big battery of tests to watch everything because, you know, I want to make sure that my dogs are are in tip top shape. But, uh, But I love what you said there, you know, Julia, about supplementing. And you're right. My absolute favorite go to sweet potatoes. Right. Sweet I mean, that potatoes. is one of nature's superfoods. <laughs> so if you're looking for a summer delight for your dog, don't hesitate. You know, share some sweet potatoes. That is absolutely, you can't go wrong. Great for raw digestion. Or the, cooked? I prefer cooked for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Raw so, might be pretty hard to eat, yeah. <laughs> even for yeah. humans. Like for, exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some eat it raw, though. The can... yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Oh. And for yeah. your cat, what do you feed your cat? Yeah, this is where we wind up with the ethical feeding friction because I'm not happy with any of the current uh, vegan options. So we do a combination of home prepared meals for her and we do have to supplement it with uh, with fish proteins. It's just, it is an awful concession, but I'm yeah. the first to admit it. I'm not happy, which is why I'm so actively researching and working on bringing a better solution because I, I just don't think that we've had a really, what I would consider an adequate feline plant-based diet like i just i'm not satisfied with it you know so again you know it's it's a concession every day when i feed you know itty bitty kitty which is her name <laughs> uh, uh, you know, i kitty. feel that <laughs> but feel that tinge of guilt because i just don't have a better solution for her right now not one and and you know and I, i'll be also very frank with you guys um according to my wife at least this is probably our last cat because she's just really can't do it anymore and right. itty bitty kitty is uh, almost 15 so she wow. grew up with our daughters right so this was kind of their cat in fact they actually found her oh, <laughs> so wow. she came from a gas station yes it's long you know everybody's got those stories of rescues but so yeah. so they brought itty bitty into our life she's a lovely lovely cat but you know again my wife uh, in particular you know this she's like i you know, and so you can imagine I'm really trying to ramp up my efforts because I want another cat after sure. itty bitty. But my sure. wife is like, unless you can solve it, you know, I, I, I can't do it. And that's legit, right? That is right. totally legit. Fair enough. Yeah. It is. Well, you will achieve that goal. I, yeah. We believe in you. You can do it. Yeah. We know yeah. it. It'll come oh, soon. We will. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, I have sure. utmost confidence. Yeah. We, we, yeah. I will say this. It is kind of a drum beat from uh, Ryan and myself. So Ryan's is Ryan Bethencourt, the CEO. Uh, you know, I don't know that a week goes by that we don't push somebody in our research department <laughs> to say, all right, wait, can we do this? What about that? You know, have you thought, have you thought of that? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And like you said, it's all about just getting the proper nutrients. It's just got to figure out how to get them. Right. So, right. yep. I mean, regulation and yeah. cost. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah we, exactly. We can send someone yeah. to the moon. I'm sure we can figure out, you know, how to <laughs> decompose or like break down and grab what we need out of stuff, right? And, so. and you know, one thing too, just to be aware, and I apologize, but I think it's, I mean, you, you have an audience that uh, this resonates with and understands, but, you know, we are up against considerable market forces. I mean, you yeah. know, the agriculture lobby is strong and deep and persistent, uh, and they yield considerable influence. And in, in the book, The Clean Pet Food Revolution, I kind of go into the details of how ag-gag laws really 
you know, prevent you from understanding what ventilation shutdown is, for example, one of the things I'm really fighting against right now. And, and you know, how the, they slow down progress, right? So look at what they've done with, with nut milks, right? So almond milk isn't milk, right. soy milk yeah, isn't, yeah, I mean, yeah. all this nonsense. <laughs> But it slows down progress. Right. So you have to be aware that when people like us are working through the regulatory process, we are having to work within rules that are designed to slow us down. And so, mm. you know, a lot of people are like, why don't you just do it now? It's like, well, we could, but we probably would get it pulled off the market immediately, right? Yeah. Because they would sue us. Somebody, some, some other, you know, group or industry would come out. And, and this is what's happened. I mean, you've seen this with other plant-based options. And so we mm -hmm. have to be thoughtful and methodical. And remember that, I mean, pet food now is a significant profit center for agriculture. So we, you know, we are now saying, wait a second, we think that maybe, you know, you shouldn't be making money killing animals to feed dogs and cats. And that's, you know, that's not always a well-received message. Exactly. All these animal byproducts make our pets sick as well. I mean, so many cats, especially they get diabetes when they get older. I don't think that's normal, you know? No. No, not at all. And when we look no. at the number of recalls and pet foods, you know, they're almost always centered around the animal protein. So, I mean, this is a, I, I think it's kind of a well-known problem, but, you know, until you can offer a solution, you know, I, I think sometimes it's pointless to make a big fuss about, you know, there's a problem, but no, I can't <laughs> fix it. So, you know, one of the reasons that we were so passionate because, you know, look, I'm coming at it from you know, an animal welfare, climate change perspective. But at the same time, I'm also deeply concerned about the health of, of pets. I mean, I've even mm -hmm. mentioned to you that my own concerns with feeding my cat certain commercial, you know, plant-based cat foods, right? So I had to make sure that not only were these the most humane and compassionate and cruelty-free foods, but they were also the most healthy and nutritious. And of course, that's why we went with dogs. That's why the formulation is, is very specific and precise. You know, mm -hmm. my, my 20 years of research and work in pet obesity really, you know, it's kind of funny that, you know, when you're along the journey of life, and I'm far enough along that journey to be able to speak now with a considerable experience, you know, you start to realize, wow, these are steps and they do lead someplace, right? And so mm -hmm. I think it's it's really, I think wherever you are in your journey in life, it's very important to realize that every day, if you're trying to make progress and move something forward, you're probably going to wind up, you know, miles ahead and you're going to look back and go, wow, okay, that made sense that I started doing that research on pet obesity 20 years ago, right? Because that led me to understanding protein physiology and understanding that, hey, we can get those same amino acids from plants or yeast, you know, and mm -hmm. it, it's healthier and better. Exactly. Yeah, right. I think we take for granted the, the little steps that we've taken over the years, like even at like, you know, elementary school or learning how to count or, you know, do simple math that we use every day. Right. But like yeah. normal kids won't know it unless you get taught it. So it's amazing how these little steps just add up to, you know, where we are today and how we evolve and, and keep moving forward and learning more. Right. Quite amazing. Yep. And, and I do think that this also, you know, we are you know, people that are younger than you, that are even perhaps uh, younger than my kids, you know, uh, that are, you know, just now about to enter into their 20s. Um, they're growing up in a world that is less hands-on experiences and more virtual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know how that plays out, right? You know, we've really tried to make sure, and your generation, you know, you've, you've had a lot of very good physical experiences, notwithstanding the current pandemic, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, we try to supply those experiences for our children, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of people around the world are starting now to focus on the screens in front of them, and, and there's value to that, don't get me wrong, but, you know, I do, I do wonder how, like you said, those little baby steps along mm -hmm. the life journey. How are they going to, you know, where, where will they lead and what are those steps? And, uh, you know, I'm an eternal optimist. I think it's just going to change the way people think and behave and act and live. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's also something that I go, we need to be cautious about and make sure that we are supplying rich, meaningful experiences that can profoundly impact the future. Right. So true. Yeah, like I always say, it's always ordered chaos. Everything in the universe is all chaotic and we don't know what's going on, but it all is ordered into a certain pattern, you know, to where we are today, right? If things weren't so in line, we probably wouldn't be here today. So it's right. crazy. Right. It's Second crazy law of thing. dynamics. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so why is it important for dogs to wear a harness instead of a leash? Is it just because you're pulling on their neck type thing or is it just way better for their back and everything in general? 
Shane, the number of tracheal and throat injuries that I've seen in my career are significant. I think most oh, wow. veterinarians that have been in practice. So you're absolutely right. It's mm-hmm. when that that little dog or the, oh that big dog, you're right. out on the the walk and they see a squirrel or another dog or another person and they right. le- leap or lurch out. It's that immediate concentration mm-hmm. of force. You know yeah. the dynamics here it's are like, significant, yeah. and Distress. so it causes. <laughs> damage yeah right. so we like walking halters because again it distributes that that pressure that force over a larger part of the body and of course obviously the trunkal area is going to be the core is the strength of the body so we know that you will a have better control over your dog and b you know it's virtually it's very difficult to injure your dog like that and i'll tell you you might you might have seen there was a viral video about a a lady uh, a white lady who called um oh in cops new york black yeah, and in Central uh, Park murder, right? yeah. it was just outrageous. But but yeah. in the video, what caught my eye and my wife's eye immediately was her jerking, jerking the dog, the dog. Right? Uh. like lifting her, off, lifting the dog off the ground by like the collar. Of the, that's the awful. Neck. Yeah, that's nuts. It's awful. So you know, again, that's that's a horrible example and yeah. a bit out of context. But if you want to see the types of force dynamics that I'm alluding to, that's really an excellent example. A horrible, no horrible doubt. situation. Yeah. But yeah. you know, the reality is you can e- instantly see um because if your dog pulls off you know and you see them you're like i'm out for runs and i see these people with these retractable leashes which i think should be uh, banned but anyway the dog's 20 foot in front of them they have when you think about the physics of it they have no control the force dynamics at the end of that leash are tremendous so this dog snaps off rears you know pulls back it rears them back i mean shane come on no not good I see. Still so they should ban them. They should right, ban them. But so like, many people are still wearing them. Like, like I would say, uh, two thirds of the so people many, I um, see are dogs, wearing. I mean. Yeah, with the neck collar one yeah. instead of yeah, behind them. Yeah, Vancouver, like. Yep. A lot. It's convenience, right? It's yeah. convenience. And so I, I think people then also think, well, my dog doesn't. He's not going to lurch like that. He's not. I'm not going to string him up like that. Of course, right. you're probably not. But if it happens, it happens. And I will tell you, as a veterinarian, there's very little we can do to repair that site because, oh. you know, these are really, I mean, when they do tear the trachea, the, the tracheal ring, rings collapse, right. I mean, that is nearly impossible. There are some biosynthetic, you know, cartilaginous rings that are used in people but imagine it's a chihuahua imagine it's a a 10 kilogram dog you know we don't it's very very challenging so ernie why do you think they're still on the market the collars just cheap in the yeah, they're cheap. And look, yeah. my dogs, my dogs have very stylish collars, so we like that. That's what their ID band is on. They're microchipped, of course, but you know, I, I will say this. You know, w- my wife would tell you that she doesn't want them running around naked, right? So, <laughs> yeah, a bit of a style element. But sure. when we walk them, we then walking is, requires the harness. So there's two different situations, right? Okay. There's one, my normal dog collar. That's just how we've raised Harry and Jenny. Harry and Jenny from Harry Potter, if you're wondering. Aww. Oh, and, nice. Uh, but, but then they have walking harnesses. They have, you know, they have swim vests, right? I mean, so they have all these other tools that allow them to go out and engage in physical activity with us. So it's just, you know, again, it's just a matter of, I mean, come on. You know, I do water sports. I do cycling, running, you know, all those things, right? Mm-hmm. We have gear that we put on or use for those specific sports. When you walk your dog, you put on a harness. Right. Simple. Fair enough. That makes sense. Like, I wish more people would do it the way you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, more people need to get a harness for their dogs, um, for sure. And cats, too, I would assume. Yeah. Same thing, right? I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. I yes. mean, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Walking or bunnies. I, or humans, yeah. anyone. <laughs> you don't want to be probably, jer- like, pulling them by the neck, right? So... It doesn't really yeah, make logical again, sense, but, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, you know, it's kind of funny, like, you know, um, <laughs> in nearly 30 years of practice, I've had maybe a couple of cat owners who really were able to train their cat to walk on a harness. It can be done. It's yeah. a beautiful thing to witness. But, I've you know, seen it a couple easy. times in Vancouver, yeah. definitely. I see that quite a lot. Actually, yeah, I've seen it quite a lot. I'm like, is that a cat with a harness and they're walking it? Because you don't normally see cats with any right. type of leash or harness. They're pretty like independent. They don't like that stuff like right. at all. So, yeah, yeah we tried it with itty bitty when she was young. Not having didn't, it didn't go over so well. She <laughs> yeah, doesn't wear a harness. Do you have a stroller for your pets? Yeah, some people have strollers. I do not. not. You're way too active to have a stroller. I think. Yeah, we yeah. would think that would and make you know, them not as active, and maybe you know. Sometimes they're sick, though. I think they use. Yeah, too, I right? would. But, yeah, for sure. But sometimes so, I think that's torture in a way. Like. <laughs> 
dogs need to move, right? They need to run. If, there's, if they're home all the time, that's not good for them too, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I want them to engage in physical activity as often and frequently as possible. Yeah, right. we're not not meant to sit. So, uh, yeah. what are some good snacks to uh, feed your dogs and cats and pets? Yeah, um, my absolute favorite go-to and Harry and Ginny's staple baby carrots. Uh, dogs oh, yeah. like crunch things, so baby carrots are easy. You know, I find myself snacking on them. I see my <laughs> girls snacking on them. You know, they're all home now for the pandemic, going to school online. Oh but, yeah, um, right. But, you know, so, so baby carrots, easy, inexpensive, and the vast majority of dogs, in my experience, love them. And then I go into things like celery, broccoli. I slice a lot of cucumbers. We're a big cucumber family here. Mm-hmm. So, they like, they love sliced cucumbers. That's another great summertime refreshing. Remember, cucumbers are just full of water. They're right. probably 80 plus percent water. And so nice hydrating, you know, summer thing. In fact, another little secret is if you take the cucumbers, put them in their freezer or the refrigerator, All it's right. a nice refreshing cooling oh. uh, sort of summer, summer snack. You can also cool. put uh, any of these in uh, uh, ice tray cubes, right? Super inexpensive. And so if your pup's outside and it's hot, you can kind of give them one of these to lick on and then they get a, we call them ice surprises, <laughs> right? Nice, like a popsicle <laughs> for your pet. Sort of. Yeah. Water I'm popsicle. A of, yeah. A big fan of broccoli as well. You know, we know oh, yeah. it's an immunomodulator. It helps activate the cytochrome P450, which is essential for cellular metabolism. So I do like broccoli. I mean, you know, people say, oh, wouldn't it give them the dog gas? You know, I, I guess if you gave them an excessive amount, but, you know, a couple of florets, you know, a couple of heads, you're, you're fine. Uh, my dogs love chewing on the stalks. But, you know, again, what, whatever your dog, I think broccoli is a great, you know, zucchini. I think I might have mentioned celery, you know. I like crunchy vegetables. I prefer those because, again, dogs seem to be very satiated with, you know, that, that crunchy stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. And are there any cool snacks for cats they like, too? Yeah, this is where we sort of run out of options quickly. Uh, my cat yeah. personally likes some dried sweet potatoes, so we dehydrate uh, sweet oh. potatoes oh, cool. so as, our, as a snack for us and our dogs. But, you know, that's a little more work, but she does like that. I would say your results may vary. Um, <laughs> right. But, you know... Yeah, th- then you're kind of back to, to animal meat products, you know. So I guess if you're going to do that, you know, try to find wild caught, you know, salmon or tuna or something. I, I don't even like to say tuna, but but right. anyway, you know. I yeah. heard like cats even like uh, chickpeas, you know, with dolls sprinkled. Yep. Right? Yep. S- some, yes, some, cool. some like orbanzo or chi- chickpeas. Uh, my cat does not. Uh, uh-huh. and, and what I will say this is if you're eating dinner or you're preparing a meal and you notice that your cat gets curious because their sense of smell is so heightened and they do tend to like more savory types of aromas and which is incidentally why a lot of cats try to eat our dog food because that umami from the yeast proteins that savoriness i think a lot of cats are like wow that's pretty appealing but if you notice that happening when you're when you're making something in the house just offer a little bit to your cat and see what they see what they make of it. You know, make sure it's not too hot or too right. cold. You know, cats do like certain temperature uh, preferences. But my point is that just don't you know be open minded, explore, and and you might find. We had a cat years ago that would lick coffee. Uh, Freddy cat. Uh, his oh, yeah. name was Freddy Cougar <laughs> because he had twenty five toes. Uh, he was a wonderful cat. Uh, but uh, yeah, he would. Uh, if if I had my coffee mug and put it down for more than two seconds, he would hop up and <laughs> start def- take, take advantage. Yeah. Is Crazy. that your special kind of cat coffee? Do you know the? Yeah, like they feed like him the body. cat. The cat. Uh, the what is oh, it? The, great, the civet. Oh, that's yeah, the that's civet cat thing. one, and then right. yeah, yeah. That one's nasty. Oh. That. Thank you for saying that. That I was seems weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just seems so unnecessary for whatever reasons, whatever. Right. Yeah. It's and nuts. and then, of course, this time of year, watermelon is always, you know, because we're cracking oh, open right. watermelon. So watermelon is, I mean, dogs love it. You know, mm. low calorie, hydrating. Okay? So, you know, a lot of the, the melons, you know, our dogs like those as well. And they're right. great. You know, with fruits like berries and bananas and even apples, they are calorically dense. So we have to be cautious with the, the amount, right? So you don't want to give large servings. But the reality is those are great in my moderation so if i'm having an apple i'm very likely i'm going to give a slice to each of my dogs and they love it you know but i'm not going to give them half of the apple which <laughs> would be too many calories for why them. is it a problem for dogs the high calorie cal- um dense foods? For, for gaining weight for obesity oh, yeah it, although they're that active it can still happen that they gain weight quickly well well again it depends on how active they are oh, you know okay. in our study, probably how big right how big the what's that? How big the like the the pet is, right? 
how big the dog is. Like obviously a bigger Absolutely. dog is gonna need more calories than like a small little chihuahua type thing, right? So exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's you know this is why kind of having a good idea of how many calories your dog should be fed each day, and you can go to petobesityprevention.org. We have lots of calculators and different scales and ways you can kind of get an idea. But again, working with your veterinarian, we use something called the body condition score, and then we look at their age and their sex and previous or existing medical conditions, and then we can give you a more precise caloric uh, count for each day. And, and it's really important, I think, for most pet owners to have an idea. It doesn't mean that you have to count calories every meal or every treat or snack right. that you give, but you should have an idea. Are you getting close to that limit you know, each day? And I think that's one of the ways to build awareness and not just, you know, again, mindlessly give your dog you know, whatever you're eating. Right. Yeah. They look at you so cute, though. You know, like, <laughs> I have to give a little bit, though. <laughs> They, really, yes, they look crunch, so hungry. You know? They it's look so like nice. their eyes are bigger than their stomachs and they just want it all, right? Right. That's right. And this is where being good pet parents comes into play. You, know, yeah, you have right? to sometimes tell your kid. Yeah, yeah. because I used to always <laughs> tell vets in my lectures, you know, look, if you give any child on the planet the choice between a bowl of chocolates and a bowl of kale, <laughs> you know, you're going to find that about 99.9% .9 of the children choose the bowl of chocolates. No that doubt. doesn't mean it's a good idea. It's not going to be healthy or nutritious. So, you know, as parents, sometimes you have to go, you got to have the, the, the kale or the spinach or whatever. Right. right. Huh. Yeah. You got to guide them, right? They don't really understand exactly right. what they're exactly. doing yeah, no, yeah. Julie, right. Julie, Julie's like oh no but yeah, I wanted exactly. to give him a whole watermelon I just love the crunch of like how yeah, satisfying it's very it is for them it's very satiating to watch them eat like, I don't know not satiating satisfying it's very satisfying watching dogs eat like watermelon and crunch I don't know yeah it's, I like that sound of it yeah I just like, like watching it's weird I don't know it's different than yeah. when you see someone else eating but when you see a dog really like they actually really appreciate every bite you give them because they know they can't eat all the time, right? Yeah, they can't just go to the store or like, you know, I want this one day. Like they, they really appreciate it when well, you give and you it know, yeah. What's amazing is you two, the emotions that you're expressing and sharing are tapping into 30, 40, thousand years of coexistence and coevolution because that exact feeling and response has been learned and earned over thousands and thousands of years of feeding dogs and so that's why they do pull on our heartstrings that's why we do feel this emotional connection with food and love mm -hmm. and so you know it's just an expression of that relationship having said that we live in a world of abundance and therefore it's very easy to over express that love and so we want to be cautious and make sure that we are mindful of new Christian and help and not oh we we'll lose you for a second there you go sorta <laughs> sorry we couldn't hear you for a bit hey that's okay can connection you? might have been bad so okay. where where can the listeners uh find you if they want to know more about yeah, the book and other uh, stuff. Yep. Yeah, for the, the dog food, wildearth.com. Uh, you can certainly learn more about me at drernieward.com. That's D-R-E-R-N-I-E-W-A-R-D.com. Clean Pet Food Revolution is also a great website you can check out and check it out on Amazon or at your local bookstores. But again, you know, for me, it's just about, you know, connecting on social media, whatever. I'm at, at Dr. Ernie Ward, D-R-E-R-N-I-E-W-A-R-D. Wherever you are, I'm there. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, you name it. You're everywhere. Perfect. Amazing. Wow. You're such an inspiring person. You, know, <laughs> you and your whole family, you know, yeah. just like your journey and... You have such a unique niche, you know, that it's still, like, not enough information out there, I find, for people. You know, like, we know so many people that are vegan, but even, like, for the pets, they're a bit more, like, as I mentioned before, hesitant, right? So, mm -hmm. we're so, like, Im impressed and honored, you know, that we have you on our show. And yeah, we appreciate the time and the clarity. For, yeah, and for your information, pets. you simplified it so well for people to understand it better because, I mean, you come from a scientific background, you know, it's sometimes hard to make it simple you know to explain <laughs> it simply right but because it's so complex and definitely check out 
this book, Shameless Plug, because I tried to clarify even more and really go into the hard science of it. You know, there are about 26 pages of scientific citations. So, you know, I, my editor is like, can you not write a paragraph without a scientific study? And I was like, nope, <laughs> that's how I work. Yeah, so, really, really happy. It's also co-written with a dear friend of mine, an animal ethicist from the UK, Alice Oven. She did remarkable work, really helping put together, you know, some of these thoughts and ideas, and and really helping, you know, keep it all reined in. And then Ryan Bethencourt contributed as well, who's our CEO. Wow, that's that awesome. Sounds amazing. Yeah, sounds great. We'll have to check out that book. Yeah, thanks again for your time, and it's been an honor to have you. Yeah, and keep on doing what you're doing because you're doing such a amazing impact to the whole world mm -hmm. well thank you and i hope everybody stays safe and if you have a dog or cat give them a hug for me i really really appreciate that <laughs> Aww, sounds definitely. great we'll do that yeah, <laughs> okay take care all right ernie take care eh bye. thanks again thanks bye all right ciao